Now we might ask, why do we want to have friendship with the Lord? So we're told in the Isha Upanishad that only the Lord's devotees and friends can understand the Bhagavad Gita. So if we'd like to understand the supreme science of spirituality, of the self, of God, of self-realization, we have to become the Lord's friends. Just trying to understand it through scholarship or even just trying to understand it through devotion without friendship will not be sufficient. And another reason is given, Srila Prabhupada gives in a lecture on the Chaitanya Charitamrita in 1975, that if we want peace, we have to become Krishna's friend. We have to understand that Krishna is our friend, that God is our friend. So although certainly we all like excitement and adventure in our life also, in addition, we all would like peace, isn't it? Yes? Everybody like peace, inner peace? Yes. So to have inner peace and wisdom, we need to become the friend of God. We talked the other day about how various religions in the world, thank you so much, teach us, thank you, teach us about what is the ultimate truth. And some people said how most religions teach us to fear God. We are talking about loving God, but this is loving God as a friend. Now, there's two main categories in which we will look at friendship with the Lord. The first is what we call a sadhana. Sadhana means a form of practice. So just like if you want to become if you want to become an expert anything, you want to become an expert musician or dancer or painter or computer programmer or runner or anything, you need to practice. And it's even true for something very natural, just like this little girl who's jumping. So she had to practice walking, right? How long did it take her between the time she first stood up for a couple seconds and the time she was walking? Some months probably, right? Some. Yeah. And now I saw her jumping. So that also takes practice. When children first try to jump, they do this, but they, their feet don't get off the ground. So even something that's natural, like walking, a newborn baby, if you hold them up, their feet will go in a walking motion. So it's a natural part of the human body, but still we have to practice. Or speech, we have to practice speech. So even though love of God is natural to the self, we have to practice. This practice is called sadhana, which basically means like a repetition. So learning to be the Lord's friend can be part of our practice for perfection. And the other category is what we call a rasa for some devotees. So that's for those who are already enlightened, for those who are already liberated, for those who are already self-realized, they may have a particular relationship with the Lord as a friend. So these are two different categories of friendship with the Lord. So first we're going to look in depth, and the, the bulk of our presentation is on this, as friendship as a way of practicing to revive our original inherent love of God. Now this also has two divisions. The Sanskrit words are vishvasa and mitra. And if you can't remember the Sanskrit, that's not so important. We'll be defining these as we go along. But because there really isn't an English one-word equivalent for these, we're using the Sanskrit terms. So first looking at vishvasa. Again, remember, these are things that we can deliberately practice. So vishvasa means to have strong faith or confidence in the Lord as one's benefactor. Now, one may say, well, what about the word shraddha, which means faith? And so there really is a kind of equivalence between the Sanskrit terms visvasa and shraddha. But vishvasa means a particular result of shraddha. So shraddha means basic faith. And vishvasa means bringing about a particular 
kind of faith, a particular result of faith, in fact, the highest result of faith. Just like there's so many people who have faith that God exists. We spoke this morning about whether or not God exists. And the majority of people on this planet, if you ask them, does God exist, would say yes. Well more than 50% of people on the planet have faith that God exists. But there's levels and kinds of faith. So my guess is that most people who say they believe in God don't do anything with that belief. Right? Most people say, I believe in God. Well, what do you do based on that belief? I go to church on Christmas, you know? <laughs> Something like that. I give some charity. I try to be a good person. It, it, there's, their actions on that belief are very low. And therefore, the, the level of the belief they have is not very developed. Does that make sense? So this vishvasa, that I have friendship with the Lord, is the highest result of this faith, or shraddha. So we have this very, very famous verse in the Bhagavad Gita, 529. The Sanskrit is bhoktaram yagatapasam sarvaloka maheshram suvadam sarvabhutanam yatramam shanti michiti which basically says, the translation, someone who's in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities, attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. So if you want peace, you have this faith that God is my benefactor. He is my well-wisher. We also talked this morning about how the one argument in favor of atheism is that people seem to suffer unfairly. And I think many times when the person who's suffering is me, it's difficult to think of God as my benefactor, isn't it? You know, that's not only when people lose faith in the existence of God, but when they lose faith in the idea that God cares about them. You know, if I think, well, I've been a good person, I've been a moral person, I've been even a religious person, and yet I'm suffering this disease, or I'm suffering this financial difficulty, or family difficulty, or job difficulty, or whatever it may be, or someone very dear to me is suffering, someone very dear to me was killed, or is very ill, or something like that, or I've been defamed. You know, in those sort of circumstances, one may think, well, how does God care about me? If he, if he really cares about me and he's all-powerful, why is he allowing this bad thing to happen to me? So this complete faith that no matter what happens to me, God is my friend, is a very, very high level of faith, isn't it? Yes? I, I often think of it, I have um, a friend whose husband, at, at a very young age, about 30 years old, got a very rare form of cancer and had to undergo horrific treatments with chemotherapy and radiation. I mean, his immune system was so compromised that he had to be isolated in the hospital in like a special room that you could only go in there with a hazmat suit. You know, he basically was, he couldn't be exposed to any of the normal germs. And the physical pain he went through from the medical treatments, not just from the cancer itself, but from the medical treatments, was also just horrific. And, you know, I was thinking about that, thinking, okay, how is it that someone can have such faith in the doctors? When the doctors look at, you know, you may have very few symptoms. You may, in fact, you might have no symptoms or very mild symptoms, and the doctors say, hey, I found this cancer, and it's malignant, and you're going to have to suffer in all these horrific ways with all this intense treatment in order to get well, and people have faith in that, yes? They have faith that the doctor looks at your x-rays or your MRI and that that really is a malignant cancer, and they have faith that by taking this medicine where their hair falls out and they're vomiting, and their you know, wife has to come in in a hazmat suit, they have faith that the doctor's doing this for their benefit, isn't it? 
They have faith that the doctor is, is not malevolent. Yeah? I mean, one time I was, uh, I was going through some medical tests to find out whether or not I needed surgery, and the surgeon says, well, there's not, any indi it's not enough indication here that surgery would help you. And then he's looking at me, and he said, you know, I love cutting people up. He was like looking at my abdomen. He's like, you know, I, I love being a surgeon. He said, but I'm not going to open you up without a good reason. So, you know, we trust that even if our surgeon loves cutting people up, which he obviously really did, and he was quite honest about it. In fact, it was a little freaky, honestly. And having somebody look at you, I'd love to cut you up. I was like, oh, that's nice. And uh, still, he was saying, I'm not going to do a surgery on you just because I like cutting people up. I'm only going to do a surgery on you if it's going to be good for you. So we have that faith, and we're willing to let somebody cut open our body or give us all kinds of noxious chemicals. Yes? So that degree of faith in God, that extent of faith, that even if I'm going through something horrific, there's some beneficial reason for it. Now, some very interesting verses in the Bhagavad Gita, and my friend Narayani, who I think comes here sometimes, pointed out this particular relationship to me. How in Bhagavad Gita 2.45, Krishna says, Nir yoga kshema atmavan. Don't worry about protecting what you have or getting things you need, but rather just focus on spirituality, focus on the real self. And then one might ask, well, if I give up all anxieties for gain and safety, and, and I just safety of what I own and gain for what I don't own, and I just focus on the self, who's going to take care of protecting what I have and giving me what I lack? And in 9.22, Krishna says, yoga kshema vaham yaham. I'm the one who's going to take care of everything. Of course, you may have heard this story. There was this very famous devotee of Krishna. And when he read this verse, 9.22, in the Bhagavad Gita, he said, I don't know if I believe this. I don't know if I believe that Krishna, aham means I, that Krishna will personally take care of protecting what we have and giving us what we lack. Maybe he'll do it through some agent, but I don't think he'll do it directly. So he actually took a pen and he crossed out this line in his Bhagavad Gita. Then he left the house. And while he left the house, these two young boys came and they came with a whole lot of food, knocked on the door. And so his wife answered the door, who's there? Oh, your husband has sent us to bring you all the food you needed for the rest of the day and the next few days and actually everything that you needed. He went out and got this stuff and told us to bring it back for you. Well, this is a lot and, and we're not very wealthy. This is a lot of stuff and very high quality. And you sure my husband bought all this? Oh, yes, yes, it was definitely your husband. She's looking at the boys and thinking, they're really, really beautiful, beautiful boys. And so delicate, and they were carrying all this heavy stuff. And as they come into the house and put everything down, she notices that there's marks on their back, as if someone had scratched their back and made them bleed. And she said, what's on your back? They said, oh, your husband did this to us. And then they left. So her husband came back, and she was not exactly very happy. She said, who were these two beautiful boys? You sent them with all these expensive things, and you're beating them? Bless you. If that happened in 2019, she'd say, you'll be arrested. But this is a very old story. And he said, please tell me what they look like. And she described them. And he said, that was Krishna and Balaram. And then he could understand that when he marked out the verse in the Bhagavad Gita, it was the same as scratching them on their back. And that they had indeed provided everything 
that he could need, that he could need, that he could want, and had done so personally. So this faith that Krishna is personally providing for us, and therefore we need not have anxiety about preserving what we have and getting what we lack. Of course, this concept is there not only in the Vedas, it's there in the Bible. This is a wonderful, very famous song, psalm of King David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So this is the mood that the devotee has. I'm being taken care of, just like a sheep is being taken care of by his shepherd. So a nice description of this idea of friendship is given in the nectar of devotion. The devotee who has confidence in devotional service to the Lord systematically follows the rules and regulations with the faith that he will achieve the platform of transcendental life. So this is another kind of faith in the Lord's friendship. We talked about faith in the Lord's friendship to provide what I need and to, to preserve what I have on an external level, but this is on a spiritual level. That I believe the Lord when he says, if you do this and this and this, you will achieve divine love, you will achieve enlightenment, you will come to me. And I have that faith that he's my friend and he's not misleading me. Right? So sometimes you may meet someone, they'll say, oh, give me your number, give me your email, I'll contact you later, and they might not, right? You don't know, are they really going to contact me later or not? Oh yeah, I can do this for you, just call me. And then you call them, oh, well, I'm busy. Or someone else answers, oh, what's well, not really the right number. And here we have faith that Krishna is our friend, that if he's telling us, just chant my name, just offer to me a leaf or flower, fruit or water. Just study the scriptures and you will surely come to me. That we believe, yes, he's my friend. He's not fooling me. He's not giving me a wrong instruction. So here we have a nice example of this friendship by Draupadi. Where she says, oh Govinda, remembering again and again your promise that your devotee will never perish, I maintain my life. Now I'm sure most of you know about Draupadi. She certainly considered Krishna her friend, but she went through a lot of tribulations in her life. Her husbands were the rightful rulers of their country, but there were many attempts to murder them. And in fact, not only were there many attempts to murder her husbands and to deprive them of their kingdom, to throw them into exile, also she herself was personally insulted as a way of disrespecting her husbands. What happened was her husband was induced to take part in a gambling match with a cheater, Shakuni. And Shakuni kept inducing her husband to gamble more and more and more and more and more. Until in a desperate attempt to get back everything, he staked his own wife. And the other party, being their lifelong enemies, dragged Draupadi into the arena in front of all the elders, all the royalty and tried to take off her clothes and embarrass her and humiliate her in front of everyone. At which time Draupadi called out for help to the Lord who gave her an unlimited sari cloth so that no matter how much she was tr they tried to disrobe her, she remained clothed. Shri Krishna. So Draupadi simply called out, Govinda, save me. Her husbands couldn't save her. The royalty couldn't save her. None of the sages could save her. But Krishna saved her.
And devotees of that level of friendship with the Lord know that ultimately I rely only on him for my protection. Draupadi is a very dramatic example of someone who first tried for protection in the ordinary means. My dear husband, protect me. My dear uncle, protect me. Oh, rulers of the country, protect me. I'm being humiliated in front of everyone. Oh, wise sages, protect me. Oh, Govinda, you please protect me. And a devotee at that level of friendship will never abandon the lotus feet of the Lord as their protection, even if offered everything, even if told, you can rule one of the higher planets. You can go to some sort of heaven and be a celestial, angelic being if you just give up the Lord. No, they won't give up ever. They will always say, the Lord is my friend. However he wants to treat me, he is my friend. So to summarize this vishvasa, the Lord is my benefactor and friend and my only shelter. From him only I get maintenance and protection. I take solace in his promise of protection in all difficulties and I will not give up his shelter for any material opulence. So this Visvasa is saying, the Lord is my friend. I have faith in his friendship, I have faith in his protection, and even if I seem to be in great tribulations, I will not give up his shelter and his protection for anything, for any inducement. Nor will I put anyone else's shelter or protection above his. The second division of friendship is called Mitra. So in Mitra, one becomes a well-wisher of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now this may be a little bit more difficult to understand. But we talked about Vishvasa, it's seeing the Lord not just as my master, or as a supreme father, or as a supreme creator, but as my friend. Right? Just like, you know, you have a head of the country here in Australia, but that person's probably not your personal friend. Right? But if you think, well, that person's my personal friend. But here it's, I'm God's friend. So Vishvasa is God is my friend. Mitra is I'm, I am God's friend. So how do we become the friend of God? Again, this is on the platform of practice. So it's very nicely explained. Anyone who's preaching the confidential message of the Gita to the people in general is so dear to Krishna that no one can be equal to him in human society. So one of the main ways that we can become the friend of God is to teach people how wonderful he is. I spoke to someone the other day who told me, oh, two of my brothers are heroin addicts. Do you know of anything that would help them? So I'm sure his parents are very happy that he's trying to help his brothers get free of their addiction, isn't it? Right? So if we want to be the best friend of God, we can help his children who are fallen in some way. We can help his children who are suffering, who are addicted to things, who are engaged in ways of living, ways of thinking, ways of being that are causing suffering to themselves and others. And that is a, the best way to become the friend of God. Now here we have a very interesting example. Megha stu ridam. Rida means heart. Su means very or very dear. Mega means clouds. The clouds are very dear to the heart of Krishna. So why? One reason is they have the same color. Krishna's transcendental color is often compared to that of a cloud. But another reason that Krishna is accepted as the friend of the cloud, that the clouds and Krishna have a friendly relationship, is that both of them satisfy the people. 
When there's excessive heat, the clouds with rain cool down the atmosphere. And in the same way, when we're burning in materialistic life, when we're not happy, we've tried so many ways to be happy in the world. And still we have a burning dissatisfaction. Krishna satisfies us with transcendental knowledge. So like the cloud satisfies people with rain, Krishna satisfies people with knowledge. Therefore, the cloud is considered to be a friend. This is further explained that there's like this burning fire of samsara, or repeated birth and death. And forest fires just happen automatically. Right? Nobody can put out a forest fire very easily. In America, in the West Coast, most years we have forest fires. Terrible, terrible fires that many, many fire departments come and struggle and struggle and struggle to put out the fire. But if there is a cloud of rain, the fire automatically goes out. Right? No matter how bad the fire is, if there's torrential pouring rain, the fire is put out. So no matter how much we are suffering in this world, when there's a rain of mercy from the Lord, that suffering is relieved. And in the same way, anybody who acts like a cloud, the cloud draws out water from the ocean. The ocean is compared to Krishna himself. And if we can be like the, like the cloud that draws out that water from the ocean of Krishna and pours it on the suffering people to relieve them, then we become like Krishna's friend. So this is the way that we can be the friend of the Lord. Now, when Krishna was on this planet 5,000 years ago, the cloud was also Krishna's friend in a very personal way. The cloud was on the planet with superior friends. And then the cloud, instead of pouring water, began to pour a small village of cloud-like snow and over the head of a Krishna. Just like umbrella to protect him from the causing sunshine. So the cloud is also considered to be a friend of the Lord in a very, very personal way. And we can also be the friend of the Lord like that, in the worship of the deity, in our worship of the holy name. We can make a, a sacred place, an altar in our home, and provide a nice place for Krishna to be. We can provide a nice place in our heart. Prabhupada says chanting Hare Krishna means you make a diamond throne in your heart. He said you imagine, he used the words imagine. He said you imagine a diamond throne in your heart and that Krishna is sitting there and you're bathing him in Ganga and Jamuna water. And he said this is not false, it is real. Krishna accepts it. So we can also offer personal service to the Lord and in that way be a personal friend like the crowd. So this is another way that Krishna is compared to a cloud, that he's attractive like a rising cloud full of water. This indicates his ever-fresh nature, his attractiveness, his ability to destroy pain, his affection, his ability to cause increase, and his nature of being full of rasa. Rasa means the taste or the enjoyment that one gets from anything. So just like a cloud is like this with water, so Krishna is also like this. So in regard to worshiping the Lord as a friend, it says that sometimes a devotee will want to live in the temple uh, for the purpose of rendering personal service. So like we have many people here who live in the ashram, and why are they living in the ashram? So that they can do personal service for the Lord as a friend. Just like if you have a good friend, you might want to live close to them so that you can often do things with them and spend time with them. Now sometimes in a mood of friendship, a person is feeling such familiarity that they'll even lie down in the temple. Now, generally, uh, that's not something that's permitted. 
but someone with great spontaneous friendship for the Lord may become casual in that way. So the summary of Mitra is, I am the well-wisher of the Lord. Like him, I want to help others and relieve their distress. I especially show friendship with the Lord by teaching others of his glories and secret of surrender to him. I want to relieve the Lord of any inconvenience out of friendship, and I may also in friendship see the Lord in intimacy with informality. So Visvasa is where I see the Lord as my friend, and Mitra is where I see myself as the Lord's friend. So both Vishvasa and Mitra are things that we can practice as part of bhakti yoga, as part of coming close to the Lord. How I can practice every day to see, oh, the Lord is my friend. He is my benefactor. And how can I be his friend? How can I do what he would like me to do? So now we're going to go to a whole different category. So for those who are actually perfected in Krishna consciousness, for those who are enlightened beings no longer identifying with the body and the mind and the, and the world, each of those perfected souls has a particular type of relationship with the Lord. So on the level of practice, everybody can practice friendship, both giving and receiving. But on this level, there are certain devotees who have this mood that Krishna is my friend. So this is of the nature only of perfected beings. We call this in Sanskrit Sakya Sai Bhav. Sakya means friendship. Sai means something that stays. It's related to the English word stay or stable. And Bhav means an emotion. So just like even in our human relationships, we have certain people who are our friends. Yes? We have certain people that, you know, we look up to them, we serve them as our employers or whatever. We have people that are our children, people who are our parents, people that are our lovers or spouses. And then we have people who are friends. It's a particular type of relationship. So there are some devotees that eternally have this choice that I want to see Krishna as my friend. So the description of this mood of elevated love for Krishna is I offer my respects to the friends of Krishna who serve him with deep trust, without restriction, without fear, while thinking that he is their equal. So when we're talking about practice bhakti, of seeing God is my friend and I am Krishna's friend, in that practice bhakti, one's not seeing the Lord as one's equal. Even though one's thinking, I'm God's friend, it's not like a buddy, you understand? But for these perfected souls who are fully enlightened, they're actually seeing God as a buddy. They're seeing that God is just completely equal to them. In fact, generally they forget that he's God. I mean, again, even in this world, there may be some very big famous person, but that big famous person has friends who forgets that he or she is a big famous person, right? You may be some, you know, multi-millionaire, billionaire, but I'm sure even the biggest billionaires, you know, when Bill Gates, I'm sure he's got friends who forget that he's rich and famous. He's just their friend Bill. You understand? They may remember sometimes. It's not like they never remember. But it's not in their normal course of dealings with him. Hey, he's just my buddy. Yeah? So there are people who, in their state of enlightenment and love, they basically forget that Krishna is God. They just think, oh, he's my friend. So there's two main categories of Krishna's friends. Those who are in the city and those who are in Vraja. So in, the, in Krishna's spiritual world, in the ultimate heaven, so most religions talk about God has his world, God has his heaven, but most people don't know much about it. Isn't that right? What goes on in heaven? I don't know. There's a bunch of angels singing, Gloria, Gloria. You know, what do people do there? Or somebody thinks that in heaven God is judging everybody. You know, after you die. I remember seeing this one Christian pamphlet. So God was this big faceless man on a throne and the people were like as big as ants. And there was a big screen and on the screen you could see all the events of your life. And then God sang, 
okay, you go to heaven, you go to hell, you go to heaven, you go to hell. And, and people were thinking that's what God does all day in heaven. You know, he just sits up there in heaven judging people. Or maybe he just sits up there all day li listening to the angels blow their trumpets and play harps or something like that. So in the Vedas, there's detailed descriptions of Vaikuntha, the realm without anxiety, the spiritual world. And there's much of it that's like grandiose cities. And then there's parts of it that are like secluded, beautiful country atmosphere. And it's explained that Krishna has his different manifestations in each of these places. Now, these are not like the cities and the country, the rural areas of this world. Everything is fully conscious. Right? The water is alive. The buildings are alive. Not just alive, but personal. Every, every, everything, every element is personal and full of love for the Lord. There's no birth, death, old age, and disease. Everybody gets all of their desires fulfilled because nobody has any evil desires. And there's unlimited varieties of activities in relationship to the Lord. But some of the Lord's eternal associates like to live in city-like places, and some like to live in rural places. So in the city like Dwaraka, the Lord has friends such as the Pandavas. Here we see Draupadi is also mentioned. Arjuna, Bhima, Saint Draupadi, Sudama, Brahman are some of the friends in the city. I also think it's very interesting that Krishna has, of course, there's no male and female as we think of it in this world. Uh, there's, no, there's no birth, there's no reproduction needed in the spiritual world. But there are beings there who are the original archetype of male and female. And Krishna has friends among both of them. In this world, sometimes it can be a little problematic when a man and woman are friends with each other, right? Sometimes it's a little iffy for a man and woman just to be just friends, right? But Krishna can be friends not only with Bhima and Sudama, but also with Draupadi. And here's Krishna with his friends, Draupadi, Bhima, Arjuna. So, of course, the Bhagavad Gita was spoken to Krishna's dear friend, Arjuna. And as we said in the very beginning, it's only through having friendship, at least on the platform of practice, that one can understand the Bhagavad Gita. Let's look at one of the most famous and wonderful verses where Krishna talks about his friendship with Arjuna. So here Krishna is saying, you can understand this mystery because you're not only my devotee, but you're my friend. Let's think about that for a minute. Could you be devoted to someone without being their friend? No, you don't think so. Could you, couldn't you be devoted to somebody for an ulterior motive? Yeah. So there's many people in the world who are very devoted to God, but are not his friend. So just being devoted is not enough. One has to be devoted and also be the friend of the Lord. So, but Arjuna was a friend in transcendental ecstasy. And therefore, when he was fighting on the battle of Kurukshetra along with Krishna, and Asvatthama was shooting arrows at Krishna, Arjuna stood in front of Krishna to protect him. Now again, this is this mood of ecstatic friendship where you feel that the Lord is your equal. So you might feel, okay, I've got to protect him from the arrows. This is this mood of friendship. And Arjuna just felt that these arrows were like flowers. They didn't even disturb him because he was so full of love for Krishna. 
So we're going to look at Krishna's friends in Raja in the country. So Rupa Goswami says that some of Krishna's friends are a little older. So there they have a mix of friendship with the mood of protection. And some are a little younger, so there their friendship is mixed with service. And then some are the same age, and so they're intimate or most intimate. Now again, when we speak of older or younger, we can say there's no birth, there's no growth in the spiritual world. So what is this talking about? But there's a sense of being a particular age. And there's a sense of being a particular age for the purpose of exchanging a particular kind of love with the Lord. The bodies there are all the same as the self, not like in this world where me and my body are different. But the, the forms that are there are actually an expression of the self. So because the self wants a particular kind of relationship with the Lord, therefore the self manifests a particular form that has a sense of being, well, I'm the same age as Krishna. I mean, how can you say how old Krishna is? He's eternal. He's timeless. The soul is timeless. Uh, but there's this sense in, in this personal relationship. So there are some examples of these personalities. Mandali Bhadra and Balabhadra appear to be a little older than Krishna to protect him. And then friends like Devaprasta and confidential friends like Sri Dhamma and Sudama, and then very intimate friends like Subal and Ujvala. this beautiful quote about Krishna's love for these intimate friends. He once said to Balara, my dear brother, when my companions were being devoured by the Agasura, hot tears poured down from my eyes, and as they were washing my cheeks, my dear elder brother, for at least one moment, I completely lost myself. So how much love the Lord is feeling for these devotees in intimate friendship. And how do they feel about him? You have spent seven nights standing constantly without sleep, holding up Govardhan. You must be very tired. Oh, my friend Krishna, throw the mountain unto Sri Dhamma's hands. Our minds are very disturbed seeing you in this condition. Or at least place the mountain in your right hand. Then we will be able to massage your left hand. So again, they're, they're thinking in this intimate equality of friendship. So these friends of Krishna, their feeling of friendship is stimulated by Krishna himself, the other friends, his age, his beauty, his bugle, his flute, his conch shell, his pleasing attitude, all of these induce them to feel Krishna is my friend. So to summarize, there's friendship as a practice, friendship as a discipline, one could say. Friendship as a means to attain enlightenment. And this is in two categories, Vishvasa. The Lord is my friend. I trust him. I trust God. I trust that he's going to take care of me. I trust everything he's doing is for my benefit. And I will not give up my trust in him for anything. And then he can trust me. God can trust me. I'm going to try to make him happy. I'm going to try to please him. I'm going to try to do what will be pleasing and happy for him. And then for those who've already attained enlightenment, some may choose to see the Lord as their intimate friend. And those are a little bit more a formal situation in the city, like Draupadi and Bhima and Arjuna. And those more casually in the country of Raja, the older ones who also feel protective, those of the same age who feel total equality, and the younger ones who feel a mood of service. 
So I hope you enjoyed this presentation on friendship. We could take five minutes if anyone has questions or comments. And again, thank you for your patience with my coming in a little late and all of our myriad technical difficulties. <laughs> questions, comments? Yes, Arjuna wasn't a reverential friend. Yes. I mean, Arjuna was more reverential than the friends in Vrindavan. And one of our evidences for this is that when Arjuna saw the universal form, he became afraid and reverential. Whereas, say, when Yasoda saw the universal form, she didn't. So Arjuna is, is a little bit more reverential than those in Vrindavan. But yes, he's on this level of intimate friendship. So he's devoted to Krishna as a friend would be devoted. And he, you can say he's Krishna's devotee in that sense, but he's not devoted to Krishna in the sense of like formal worship. Although it's interesting because Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita does talk about man mana bhava mad bhakti majaji mam namastru mam eva shishyuktam te. He's talking about worship. He uses these words as worship. But we don't find that Arjuna is engaging in this kind of formal worship to the Lord. So yes, very nice point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Any comment or question? Yes. Okay, let me try to understand your question. So you said we have faith in Krishna, but when we have so many problems, we do many things to solve the problems. And what was your next point? Okay, so what I think you're saying is, does faith in Krishna mean that we don't do anything else except say, Krishna solved my problem? Well, but that's not what Krishna says to Arjuna. Krishna doesn't say to Arjuna, okay, there's a war going on here, why don't you go to sleep on the chariot and I'll just take care of everything. Now, it's interesting that Krishna actually shows him in the universal form. He says, here's the future. He said, in the future, you will see that all these warriors that you're worried about on the other side are all going to be killed in this battle, in this war. You will win the war. He said, it's already decided. And then he says, now get up and fight. I want to ask you a question. Do people read books or watch movies where they already know who's going to win? Always. No? Always. Almost always. When I was a kid, I used to watch Superman on TV. Do you think Superman's ever going to lose? Then there would be no show next week. So you knew, I, I knew every week when I was watching Superman when I was a kid, I knew he was always going to win against the bad guys. They weren't going to kill off Superman, I don't know, maybe, do they kill off Superman now? Mm -hmm. But I still like the show. I didn't like Batman, I don't know. My friends like Batman, I found that really boring. But I like Superman, I have no idea why. I don't know, I was a little kid. But I still found it interesting, even though I knew he was going to win. So we know that Krishna is, is ultimately, he's going to solve all of our problems and he's going to save us. We don't know exactly how he's going to do it. That's kind of an adventure. And we're supposed to participate in that adventure. We're supposed to be participants. Our philosophy is ultimately of engaging in a, a playing, fun, 
adventure with Krishna. Just like, you know, when I would see the Superman show, how's Superman going to get out? I knew he would, but I didn't know how. Okay, how's Krishna going to save me now? I don't know. That doesn't mean if you cut your finger, you just look at it and go, okay, Krishna, how you? I mean, take out a bandage and put it on your finger. Krishna may be saving you by giving you the intelligence to put a bandage on your finger. That's also Krishna. You have to have the intelligence, you have to have the ability, you have to have the band-aid, right? Is it? Sometimes solving a problem is as easy as just moving a chair to the other side of the room. I mean, I've solved some major, major, major problems in life just by moving a piece of furniture. Seriously. So sometimes, you know, these, these intractable life problems can be solved by moving a piece of furniture. You ever had that experience? Sometimes you had this humongous problem and there was this very, very easy, simple solution. And you're like, well, why didn't I try that a year ago? Right? Or waking up at a different time, or going to bed at a different time, or something. So it's not that we should never take any external solution, but we should always know that ultimately Krishna is giving us the solutions. He's giving us the intelligence. He's giving us the means. And see that as part of our loving relationship with him. Not, well, either I'm doing it or he's doing it. No, he's always doing it. But he's having, he's having an enjoyable relationship with you if you choose to see it that way. Is that all right? Excellent question, by the way. Yes, sir. I hopefully understand that uh, there are various rasas, right? So you are talking various, various rasas, like Sankhya ras, right? You are talking most various rasas, yes. Yeah. So how do you understand that uh, we, will, uh, we will only develop the Sankhya ras, the friendship with the Lord, because you know, like Kasya ras or Shanta ras? So well, that depends on you. How do you understand that? Okay, in which rasa, or how do we develop that relationship? It, it awakens spontaneously at a certain point of purification. So, if you want to think of, of something material, okay? So, materially speaking, like when you're a child, you have some idea when you're a child that when you grow up you'll probably get married, you'll probably have a job, right? And maybe, maybe when you're five years old, you know what you want to do and that's what you do. You know, maybe when you're five years old, you think, I want to be a firefighter, and you actually become a firefighter. But a lot of kids, when they're five, think they want to be a firefighter, and once they get to be 13 or 14, they don't want to be a firefighter at all. Once they start to mature, they realize that their interests are different. Right? And I mean, it's not until you hit a certain age that you really have a romantic interest. So, in a sort of similar way, we have to reach a certain stage of spiritual maturity and then our natural, already existing desire to relate with the Lord in a certain way comes out. It was already there. It's not that it wasn't there. But until we reach a certain stage of purity, we don't really see it. Or, and maybe another example I can give, it's like, let's say that you had a room that was really cluttered with stuff. You know, someone had just used it as a storage room. Actually, this happened to, to me. Um, I mean, my husband and I first went to the temple in Detroit. So we were looking for a room where we could take care of the children in the morning, do a little program with the children when all the other adults were in the program. So we found a room in the downstairs floor that was just full of, of storage. And we asked permission from the tell president, you know, can we clean out this room? It took us a couple weeks. You know, we took all the old stuff out of the room. It was just full of junk. And we cleaned it. Of course, after we did that, the tell president came and said, this is a really nice room. I think I'm going to use it for, and we didn't get to use it for what we wanted to use it for. But my point is, while it was full of stuff, 
the temple president thought that the room was worthless. And he's like, sure, take it and use it for whatever you wanted. And after it was cleaned out, immediately he could understand, oh, I'd like to use this room for something else. So when we're materially contaminated, our heart is just like this, this room that's, that's been used as a storage room. And unfortunately, the things that it's been storing are not very nice. It's been storing our lust, anger, envy, greed, illusion, grief, fear, I mean, all this kind of stuff. And so that's what's in there, and it's all kind of dirty and disgusting. And so you really can't see what, what the heart looks like. You can't see what yourself looks like. It's all, it's all the stuff there. You know, and as you start clearing it out, you start, oh, wow, this is a really nice heart I've got here. You know, I'm, I'm actually a soul. I'm really a wonderful soul. And you start seeing who you are. Not just, I'm a soul, I'm a spiritual being, but you start awakening particular feelings for Krishna. So that can't be forced. You can't imagine that. You can't really look at the room full of gunk and think, well, I think it looks like that. You know, you, you, you have to be a little patient as the stuff is removed. One day it will just happen. One day there'll be this overwhelming feeling for Krishna in a particular mood. And you'll be like, oh, that's how I feel about Krishna. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. As we get more and more purified, you are the best of no. Thank you for that question. Does your rasa change? No. The, the particular relationship we have with Krishna is an eternal relationship. At the same time, it's our choice. It's not assigned to us. You know, not like in some of those communist countries where they just said, you know, well, we don't have enough welders, so you be a welder. But I don't want to be a welder. I want to be a musician. You know, or I hope I don't offend any of you who are from India, but it's like, I think sometimes the Indians think there's only like, you know, IT specialist, doctor, finance manager. Those are the only professions in the world. You know, and, and God forbid if your kid says, I want to be a musician, or I want to be a teacher, or something like that. So it's not like that. I mean, I know a friend who was brought up in India, now he's like 50, and he was, you know, worked as an IT specialist. He said, you know, I always wanted to be a teacher, but my parents forced me into a tech career. Now I'm finally going to get to be a teacher. So it's not like that. It's not like Krishna says, okay, friend, servant, cow, lover, that's what you're getting. But I don't want to be that. I want to be something else. Sorry. No opportunity for you. That's just what you are. It's not like that. It's the choice of the soul. But it's an eternal choice. So that's a little hard to wrap our heads around. Oh, by the way, before you ask, I might answer it with this question. So, you know, Krishna can expand himself unlimitedly in unlimited forms. So a liberated soul can also expand themselves. Not to the extent of Krishna. And a soul can have different relationships with different forms of Krishna simultaneously. So just like we have people who are in servitude to Ramchandra as monkeys and in friendship with Krishna as counterboys, the same soul exists in more than one place. I always wanted to do that when I was in school. It was one of my great desires. I thought, I wish I could be in school, because I didn't want to get bad grades. My parents would never have accepted that. You know, I was in one of those kind of families where you had to get all A's. So I wanted to be in school so that I could do well in school, but I wanted to expand myself and have another form that went to the beach. So I could be at the beach and in school at the same time. So actually an enlightened soul can do that. Do you still have a question? Yes. On the same subject again, when Krishna is not calling us, it appears that he's assigning the Lord to his devotees. No, 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 no. No, but that's their agreement. It's not that he had to. It's not that Krishna says, you've got to do this, like it or not, too bad. Why would you want to love a God like that anyway? You know, these devotees have this mood. Lord, I'll do anything for you. 
And he's like, well, all right, I, I need someone to show a bad example. I, I need somebody who's such a great personality that if they show a bad example, it won't give anyone else an excuse. And if you do this, you may be criticized for this for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, if it'll serve your purpose, I'll be willing to do that. So Bhisma is criticized for taking the side of the Kurus, that he was compromised. Of course, it was also their enjoyment, Krishna and, B and Bhisma, with their fighting on the battlefield. It was, so there was also something happening on a completely different level of reality. So there were, there were layers of understandings to that. Well, I mean, I used to do dramas with the, with the little children. I ran a nursery school for many years, preschool, like age two to five. So we would just do dramas among ourselves, not on the stage. I had a bunch of scrap pieces of cloth and makeup and wigs and, you know, assorted paraphernalia. So I would just say, okay, today we're going to do Krishna kidnaps Rukmini. Okay, who wants to be Krishna? I do, I do. Okay, you can be Krishna. And my daughter, who's now 40 years old, she told me that at one time when she was like three, right? So I said, who wants to be Princess Rukmini? Who wants to be Rukmini? I do, I do. But someone else raised their hand faster. So I, I said, okay, you can do it. And she was like, I didn't know this until... You know, she was like 35, she told me the story. But it happened when she was three. And she was like, oh, I didn't get played to be Rukmini. So Rukmini had a brother named Rukmi, and he's the bad guy in the story. That's why Krishna had to kidnap Rukmini to get away from Rukmi. So then I said, who wants to play Rukmi? And she said she thought that I was saying Rukmini again. And she thought, oh, maybe I didn't hear her right the first time. Maybe she didn't really, uh, you know, now she's asking, oh, me, 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 I, me, I, okay, you can be Rukmi. Oh, no. <laughs> I just volunteered to be Rukmi. So don't worry, it's not like that. Don't worry, it's not like that. You don't like, you don't like sign up for something and then go, oh, no. I thought Krishna said something else. What did I just sign up for? Don't worry about it. It's about love. It's about love, it's about freedom, and it's about voluntary. It's not force. Love isn't force. So this is, a, this is above the platform of liberation. What does liberation mean? Liberation means freedom. There's no force. At all. There's just never any force. There's not even indirect force. There's not even, you know, manipulation. Whereas, you know, in this existence, we're constantly trying to force, manipulate, cajole, bewilder people into doing what we want them to do. There's so many books and seminars, you know, how to convince people to do what you want them to do. How to convince them to buy your product, buy your service, believe in your political position, believe in your religious position, isn't it? Do their homework, cut the lawn, cook a nice dinner, whatever it is, you know. We're, try, we're trying to behave in such a way that other people will do what we have in mind for them. So it's very hard for us to understand loving relationships where that's absolutely, completely absent. Nobody is manipulating or, or forcing or, or anybody to do anything. Everything is being done voluntarily out of spontaneous, genuine love. So it's, it's a little hard for us to wrap our head around that. And because of that, we, we have some fear to see Krishna as our friend. You know, we think, well, maybe he's not really my friend. Maybe he's going to sign something to me I don't like. Maybe he's going to ask me to play a role where I'll be embarrassed for the next 5,000 years. And I'm just going to have to say yes because I'm his devotee, but I won't want to. You know, so I don't know if I can trust him as my friend. Is he really my friend? Meanwhile, Krishna's looking at us and saying, can I really trust you as my friend? 
You know, I think we worry a lot about how much we can trust him and not quite enough about whether or not he can trust us. Was there anybody else? It's almost 9 o'clock. So. Yes? How can, we so that, um... how can we increase our faith? That's a very good question. Well, first of all, you can hang around with people who have a little bit more faith than you. And the other thing is that you can test a little bit, just a little bit, just ever so slightly push the borders of your faith. Just ever so slightly and see what happens. And then you'll gain more faith and then you can push the borders just a little bit, ever so slightly. And gradually, gradually your faith will increase. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.